So next up and finishing us off is um, Robin Cattell. We want to really touch base on caregiving because we know that we just have wonderful caregivers that we work with and um, I'm sure those patients in the room or other family members can really give a big shout out to caregiving and Robin Cattell really thinks a lot about um, our caregivers and ways to support them. So she's one of our clinical nurse specialists at the U University of San Francisco Memory and Aging Center and she's an assistant clinical professor in the UCSF School of Nursing. She got her undergraduate degree at UCLA and her graduate degree here at UCSF. She is the lead nurse for the Funderly federally funded research programs on frontotemporal dementia and Alzheimer's disease and is the facilitator of two caregiver support groups. So she works closely with patients and families with atypical dementias, both in research and the clinical setting. Thanks, Christine and everybody for coming. Um, it's always good to have a chance to talk about these things. Um, also, you know, coming out in this weather, our, our drought-busting uh, storm today. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, living with uh, PSP and CBS. Thinking about doing this talk, I realized that we probably need a whole other conference, you know, another half day to talk about this because I think this is sort of the nitty-gritty. The and I, I'm probably not going to cover everything that people want to talk about, but we're going to have a panel afterward, and also please feel free to talk to me one-on-one -on -one also. So we'll get started. Um, so as we've kind of touched on a little bit um, all morning, there's some very uh, particular symptoms that people with PSP uh, present with that cause day-to-day -day problems with their function. Um, Eye movement problems can interfere with uh, ambulation, with judgment, um, uh, just seeing things in the periphery, um, and then early balance problems, this postural instability, um, and then abrupt losses of balance can cause falls. There's slowing of thinking and movement, um, mood issues like impulsivity, ap apathy, depression, uh, swallowing issues, which Joey talked about, and then uh, communication issues. In CBS, there's some overlap with some of these same issues. Um, people with CBS have rigidity in their limbs. Um, they may not be able to use some of their limbs. Um, there may be pain associated with their syndrome. Um, there are language disorders that can either come before or after the movement problems. Slowed thinking, um, problems with um, solving problems and reasoning, and then uh, mood and behavior issues. So um, what we see in, in, at, in our clinic and, and, and in people at home is people with CPS have um, this rigidity in their arms or legs. Um, they may be not coordinated in their movements. They are having more trouble processing what's going on in their world. Um, people with PSP may be more single-minded about things. They might be impulsive about moving or thinking or talking. Um, people with PSP have this sort of uh, signature um, wide-eyed look sometimes and they don't blink as much, which can lead to dry eyes and vision problems. And um, for both, um, in both cases, people have a relative sparing of other kinds of cognition, like memory, and so um, they're very aware and very sensitive to their problems. They, they may be embarrassed by them, concerned about them. Um, and when you're talking to people, especially about things like falls, um, patients will know that they have this problem. They will agree that they need to be careful they understand the issues involved, and yet they can still fall because they may be very impulsive about moving toward a target or wanting to do something in the moment. So talking about falls, which is a very big issue in both disorders, um, there are some real danger zones or sort of 
um, predictors of falling, and it's when different movements are happening, um, such as going from sitting to standing, or turning, or trying to maneuver stairs, um, trying to do more than one thing at a time, like trying to talk and walk at the same time, or, or listening to somebody talking to them while they're walking, or doing one of these other activities. Um, and in PSP, there's a relative freedom of movement, uh, er, especially earlier on in the illness, and so people are sort of free to move, but in, a, in an unsafe way. Um, in, in CBS, there may be more problems with initiating or coordinating movement, lifting the feet, moving the feet. So in terms of prevention of falls, there's a whole compendium of research that's been done on falls prevention. There's a lot that you can find on our website and other websites. Um, I'm just trying to summarize a few of the key points here. Um, lighting is very important when thinking about falls. People should have night lights. They should have lighting that's very close to them, a a accessible to them, so not a lot of lamps that are out of reach or in inconvenient spots. Um, footwear needs to be solid, non-slip, um, um, surrounding the foot on all four sides, so slippers that are just, you know, without backs are pretty unsafe. Um, clothing, because of using um, the fingers and the hands can be difficult, using clothing that's easy to get on and off, um, not lots of buttons or zippers. Um, in the environment, looking for hazards, like slip, slippery rugs or rugs in general that can be trip hazards, um, sharp edges when people do fall, trying to avoid those, and then having flooring installed even that's very non-slippery. Safety bars and handrails throughout the home, in the bathroom especially, shower chairs, um, raised toilet seat to to help facilitate that kind of movement from sitting to standing, standing to sitting. And then stairs are a particular hazard for people. Um, they should be clearly marked at the top, that this is the top of the stairs, each stair marked with a, with a tape that really delineates the stair. Um, as, as you know, with PSP, looking down can be very hard, and so stairs can be quite hazardous for people. Um, sometimes it's necessary because of this impulsiveness to block off the stairways just to, the temptation can be gone then um, to go down. Um, and then other adjustments that I don't have on the slide might be a device that is more like an elevator that helps somebody get up the stairs, it's called a chair evader, there's different products out there, using ramps to get in and out of the house. Um, one thing I think that's, that's really key is that kind of chaos in the environment can lead to unsteadiness. So if there's a lot going on and a lot of things that um, are distracting, that can lead to people being more unsteady. Some of that's controllable, some of it's not, but it's something to really keep, keep a, a, a handle on. Sometimes it helps people to talk themselves through walking, especially if kind of getting started is hard. So just kind of the march uh, cadence of left, right, left, right, can help people get started and stay on task with walking. Um, and if you do fall, obviously it happens. Um, for patients, as best you can, I know it's hard when you're falling to do this, but um, go limp, try to protect your head. And in terms of head protection, um, sometimes people prefer to wear a helmet um, if they're falling a lot. Um, and for people who are with someone who's falling, it's important to kind of get in position and not become a victim of the fall yourself um, and, and try to break the fall by basically becoming a chair for the person, putting your knee out, sort of steadying yourself and uh, lowering the person down to the floor. Obviously, these things aren't always uh, predictable or possible to intervene on, but knowing those body mechanics issues can be really helpful. So they have done some research on walkers, and the winner in the contest <laughs> of walkers is the four-wheeled walker, the sort of steady, heavier walker that allows people to, and, and in tracing people's footsteps and using different walkers, it's been possible to see that the four-wheeled steady walker tends to be the one that produces the most normal gait in people. Other things to think about are 
um, helmets, as I mentioned, footwear, um, those kinds of assistive devices, using a gate belt um, to hold on to someone who's really unsteady, which is a device that goes around their midsection and, and holding on to that to try and help them stay over their center of gravity. So no pick up and move walkers. <laughs> Um, and Joey covered the swallowing issues, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail there, but um, sometimes people who are having swallowing issues, it's, it's kind of as hard as one may try, the swallowing issues may continue. Some people continue to take that risk. They, patients may choose that they want to eat a certain kind of food and so they're going to they're gonna do it. Is that part of their brain disease and impulsiveness, or is it, is it a choice? I think it's really hard in these diseases because it's, it's hard to separate those two things. Uh, but there's a, a, there's, um, in living with these diseases, I think there's a new sort of relationship to risk. And caregivers and patients develop a, a rapport about that. Um, and Joey already covered a lot of this about um, uh, supporting at meal times with food consistency, the best position of the head to, to eat, um, portioning out food to avoid this sort of pocketing and keeping food in the mouth. And once again, this idea of a chaotic environment that can impact function. The quieter, more sedate environment for eating, the better. Um, trying to avoid asking someone lots of questions while they're eating avoiding that sort of distraction so that they're able to focus just on the food and just on the eating. Um, and communication is affected. The speech and um, language problems with these disorders can, can be going along with the movement problems. I think with some people using a tablet like an iPad with special applications that help with um, communication, especially if Getting the words out is hard and just using pictures, pointing at pictures, or if writing is easier than talking, being able to write on a tablet like a Etch-a-Sketch type program can be very helpful. Um, people with PSP might, because of this impulsiveness, they may sort of talk over people a little bit or be impulsive in their conversation. I think that's partly because I think it's really hard when you have PSP to be able to think about what you're going to say, and so when you're ready to say it, you just kind of say it. And I think it's important for the people around them to be supportive of that, that they're trying the best they can to get those words out. They may kind of do it at a little bit at the wrong time or talk over people, but it's really an effort to communicate. It's really better to communicate no matter how you do it than to stop communicating. Um, so using a communication board, which is another sort of device where you can point to pictures, um, a notepad or the tablet device. Using hand gestures, I tend to talk with my hands, so it might come naturally to me, but using gestures instead of words can be less frustrating. Uh, miming situations, showing somebody what you want them to do versus saying it. Later on, it's, it's all throughout, I think it's important to be really mindful of how much language we're throwing at people, because people who are trouble, have trouble moving and thinking, it's hard for them to take in all the words that we might be saying to them. So keeping it simple, one or two words at a time, maybe just saying sit or wait or stand, just very simple words, given a lot of time and patience <coughs> to get them across. So mood issues are a part of these diseases. Um, I think they're a symptom of the brain chemistry changes, the, the cell death in the brain. Um, depression is very common. Um, sometimes people even feel so sad and hopeless they might talk about suicide, they might think about suicide. So it's really important to talk about that, bring that to the attention of the healthcare providers. Be supportive around that. I think it's, this is a really, really tough disease, both of them. An early symptom sometimes is this symptom called apathy, which is not depression. It's sometimes mistaken for depression. It's really a lack of initiative, a lack of motivation, sometimes a lack of affection or interest in, in things that are going along around um, them. And some people, especially with PSP, will have this symptom of exaggerated laughing or crying. It's uncontrollable for them. They can't do anything about it. It can be very embarrassing for them. It's not necessarily a reflection of how 
sad they feel. It might be something that's mildly sad, but their emotional response is really um, more exaggerated than would have normally been. And there are ways to treat these problems with medications. It's not a 100% solution, but I think it's worth talking to a, a care provider about. And as I mentioned before, these compensations for the, the loss of function are really important to make. Um, walkers, shower chairs, special devices for eating, all very important strategies to use. Other things to think about in terms of compensation are, you know, con controlling pain or addressing pain, very important in these, in these syndromes. It hurts to fall, but it may just hurt also to have this disease. The stiffness could benefit from some regular massage or, or relaxation techniques like mindfulness or music. Occupational therapists are extremely helpful in, in figuring out practical strategies around the house for devices and, and um, tools that can help grasp, lift, um, um, uh, reach, um, and learning to do tasks differently. Um, for PSP, especially with the eye movements, any kind of adjustment that can help bring things into the, the, the scope of vision are really important. Eye drops for dry eyes. And as the disease progresses, people need more and more help. I'm running out of time. So speaking of help at home, I'm almost done. Um, this is Lady Sybil. This is when, when Lady Sybil died on Downton Abbey is when I stopped watching the show. Uh, we should all be lucky enough to have somebody like this who could come into the home and help. Obviously, that's not the case, but there are lots of community resources out there and people available to help when things get to the point at home when it's really hard to take care of people. The other thing is there are lots of resources about of alternate residential care. Um, that's something to discuss either with us, your care team, your doctor. So support for caregivers, as Robin Riddle is very aware and very devoted to this topic, um, support groups are extremely important and helpful to people who are dealing with this, patients and caregivers, and peer support, um, people who are dealing with the same issue, whether it's somebody who has the same disease or somebody who's taking care of somebody with that disease, education like these kinds of forums, and then self-care activities, exercise, making sure your, as caregivers, the health care is, this, is taken care of for you. And then not forgetting to have those social engagement activities, family, friends, fun things to do. So thanks, everybody.